this part of our training, we are going to understand a little bit more and delve into the third phenomenon that affects heat transfer in a building. It's called radiation. Let's return to this evocative image which indicates all the three major processes of heat transfer that attribute or contribute rather to the heat that is being transferred from this flame to a vessel which is trying to boil some water. We have seen conduction as being the process that transfers the heat from the, the flame through the solid object into the hand of the person holding uh, the, the vessel. Convection is a process through which the entire fluid volume is getting heated by displacement of, of the molecules. The third process, radiation, is actually the process that conveys the heat from the flame over a distance without necessarily even a fluid being present in between. Even though in this case there is air in, its, uh, in between the flame and the pot, it would have transferred the heat nonetheless even if there was no air present because this process of radiation can act through a vacuum similar to the process of the sun heating the earth through a large distance of a vacuum between the two bodies. So let's understand that a little bit further. One of the core principles that governs the phenomenon of radiation is that a warmer object will always radiate heat to a cooler object. This process or this truth rather can be used beneficially for a building to lose the heat that, it's, that it gains by making it surrounded or bringing it into close proximity of cooler objects. And this principle is used very advantageously in the design of radiant cooling systems as we will understand in a short period of time. One of the major sources of radiation on earth, in fact the only source of radiation on earth from outside is the sun. The sun radiates heat energy to the earth in the form of a spectrum of electromagnetic waves and these waves have two distinct regions or bands which we need to understand a little bit further about. On the x-axis here is the wavelength of different forms of waves that make it to the earth and on the y-axis we have the relative energy that each of these wave bands in uh, uh, involves. In this diagram we can see that the longer less or low energy waves are called the infrared waves. These waves are the ones that carry heat energy to a large extent whereas the higher energy low wavelength waves or small wavelength waves are the ones that carry a lot of the light energy as you can see ultraviolet and visible spectrum. This part of the, of the wave spectrum carries heat and light whereas this is purely long wave radiation. This form of radiation is also the form of radiation which emits from low temperature bodies such as bodies that are heated by the earth. So for example when a wall gets heated by the sun which comes in in the form of this high energy low short wavelength radiation eventually is transmitted back into space or into other objects through the form of long wave low energy radiation. The picture of radiation presented earlier was had more to do with the sun's emittance and the reabsorption and re-emittance of, of radiation for solid objects. Here is an image which indicates a similar sort of process operating on a transparent surface such as glass. In this image we can see that there are two sources of incoming radiation. One part of the radiation from the sun transmits almost untouched except for a small component into the other to the other side of the glass surface that is known as transmittance a part of it is immediately reflected this we can witness this in many instances in our life when you see a, a glass surface reflecting the sun's uh, radiation and you can see your own reflection in it because of it this reflectance inhibits the heat transfer that is happening because of this transparent surface. So 
in in many instances one of the ways to cool a glass building is to improve the reflectance so that not too much of it first makes its way into the building of the part that is transmitted or sorry not reflected of the part that is not reflected part of it makes its way through inside called the transmittance a part of it is absorbed by the glass and this can be verified by touching the surface of the glass which actually gets warm under the influence of the sun that is known as absorptance of the absorbed radiation in the state of thermal equilibrium which means that the amount of radiation coming in should be equivalent to the amount of radiation redispersing in different ways if that has to be held true the absorbed radiation eventually has to be re-radiated out or radiated in the inward radiation back into the occupied space if this on uh, this side of the of the glass is the occupied space that portion is called re-radiation and the other portion is called emittance this image also gives clues to a building designer as to which processes would you want to facilitate and which ones would you want to inhibit to keep the building cool on the other side of course this image clearly indicates that anything that conveys the heat on this side should be inhibited and all the heat that is moving back to this side either reflectance or emittance you'd want to promote it somehow one interesting trade-off that occurs when you deal with transmittance is of course you can inhibit transmittance of this radiation to keep the building cool but this is also the part of the energy which carries light which is also a very important function of building design is to promote the the uh, ingress of natural light as well and this is something that we had already addressed in the definition of thermally comfortable and visually comfortable design which needs to balance these two competing needs simultaneously let's look at uh, some of the more classical definitions of these terms emittance absorptance reflectance transmittance each of these relates to one part or one phenomenon in the radiation spectrum one of for example emittance is the ability to release heat by radiation absorptance is the ability to absorb heat by radiation reflectance is the ability to reflect transmittance is the ability to transmit radiation what are the consequences of these different parts of the radiation phenomenon emittance improves the passive component of of design which means it reduces the sensible heat that the building is gaining absorptance worsens it so you'd want less of it reflectance is good uh, in the sense that it prevents overheating of the building transmittance the object itself which is the in this case the the glass surface itself remains largely unaffected because it is just becoming a conduit for the heat energy to go through nonetheless it does lead to the temperature rise of the objects the furniture the people inside the occupied space here are ways of controlling these different parts of the radiation phenomenon how do you play around with emittance you would play around with the surface finish making it rough or smooth for instance absorptance you could change the color of the surface darker colors would absorb more radiation lighter colors would not absorb radiation as effectively which is also the the uh, method which is used by fabric designers or traditional communities to play around with the kind of clothing they wear in different seasons or in different parts of their region to make sure that they are playing with absorptance to keep the bodies the human body cool naturally reflectance you can play around with the surface color and finish which means a more polished surface for example will reflect light more this is quite intuitive transmittance the only way to play around with this is to reduce the transparency of the material so for example a tinted glass or a smoked glass for example or one that is got etching on it reduces the amount of transmittance these are the conventional mathematical symbols that are used in equations this is quite trivial here is a pictorial depiction of the various parts of the radiation phenomenon absorptance emittance so on and so forth for different kinds of 
typical material assemblies. So for example, if you have a brick which has a surface color of white versus say a building material element which is a metal object, for example a aluminum uh, bricket or a black stone for example this could be this building material and this could be a highly engineered what's called selective coating right for example a solar photovoltaic surface could be considered a selective coating what are the various properties of these kinds of building materials as you can see for a white brick say a limestone brick the absorptance of the sun's energy will be relatively low as as you can see here, this small arrow here indicates a relatively low amount of absorbed radiation. Most of it has been reflected, as you can see. The emittance is relatively high. This curvy, long wave radiation arrow indicates the emittance. As you can see, it's pretty high. And the, the overall temperature in equilibrium conditions will be relatively cool. So this immediately indicates that this might be an appropriate element for hot and dry regions, right? Let's look at a different kind of material. This is a aluminum brick, for example, right? Uh, or a block of aluminum that could be used in the surfaces of modern IT buildings and malls, etc., which don't have, have bricks uh, as their primary construction material. In this case, the common element is that both of them will not absorb much of the solar radiation. They will either reflect a lot of it, right? Or some of it will be re-radiated after being absorbed. As you can see, the primary difference between the two is the emittance of radiation. This material was able to emit a lot of the radiation that was absorbed. So even the small arrow that was absorbed, a lot of it was re-radiated. In this case, even though the absorptance is the same as this white limestone brick, for instance, it, however, is not as effective in radiating the heat out, which means that part of the radiation will lead to an increase in the equilibrium temperature. So this is not so appropriate as a building material in that same climatic region as the, the white limestone brick. A black surface, immediately you can see in this case a big red flag or a black flag because a lot of the solar radiation is absorbed in this case the big fat arrow here emittance is also pretty high as you can see it's almost as high as the emittance of a white surface however because it has absorbed a lot of solar radiation in general its surface temperature is very hot these surfaces for example you have those the black tarred or weatherproofed surfaces that you see on buildings. One of the reasons why they are unbearably hot to live under is because of the fact that there's massive amounts of solar absorptance happening. And as you, another thing that we should bear in mind is it doesn't reflect too much of the radiation as well. It's quite logical, right? If you have a dark surface, you won't get much reflection. So this perhaps is the most poorly suited Roof, roofing material or the roofing color that you could have as a black surface. This is also the logic behind what's called the cool roof idea or the white roof idea. Selective coatings, you can basically play around with each of these phenomenon independently. It is not a very conventionally encountered material for buildings. This is the table which indicates the relative reflectance and albedo values of different kinds of materials and colors and finishes that you could use to improve the amount of solar radiation that is reflected. As you can see, up on the top part of the table, the reflectance values are relatively high. A reflectance value in this case of 0.8, which indicates that for whitewashed surfaces, approximately 80% of the solar radiation coming in is going to be reflected right back into space. So this would be an advantageous building material or a, or a surface finish to keep a building passively cool. On the lower part of the table are the darker surfaces or the darker finishes and as you can see conventional brick has a reflectance of only about 50% which means a lot of the radiation is absorbed and either re-radiated or transmitted or re-radiated inwards into the building.
these are albedo albedo is similar to surface reflectivity it's another term for it and it indicates again the amount of solar radiation that is sent back or bounced back into space instead of being absorbed by the material as you can see these these materials white ceramic tiles for example they have very high albedos compared to a dark surface so you'd of course want to choose these kinds of materials high reflective paints rather than using dark surfaces in tropical regions the next uh, phenomenon related to radiation was absorptance and emissivity after reflectivity here is a series of materials which are conventionally used and also surfaces or surface finishes rather in in uh, our tropical region and we can see the range of absorptance values is quite high it goes from about 0.6 or 0.65 rather to very low values of 0.08 and emissivity correspondingly for these materials as you can see in the case of limestone versus plaster both have similar emissivities right so whatever radiation is absorbed they emit almost the same amount in terms of percentages however the plaster to begin with first absorbs only 21% of the solar radiation which means that overall this material would be cooler to the touch as opposed to this this can be verified by touching the surface of a whitewashed wall versus the thick walls that are used for example in the construction of forts right which have a darker surface if you touch a fort wall it might not let a lot of the radiation inwards because of the thickness for example but to touch it will be a much warmer surface than a white plastered surface yeah this is what this table is trying to indicate it is of course recommended in the ecbc energy conservation building code to have materials with as less absorptivity as possible this is part of the guidelines right now and it also indicates that for a building to be compliant with the new energy conservation building code we have to pay attention to what the surface finish or the color of the roof is and it encourages us to use roofs which have very high solar reflectance and have a very high emittance no less than 90% of the solar radiation should be absorbed that was all about opaque surfaces such as roofs and walls let's look at what happens with glass here are three kinds of glass surfaces or window surfaces that are now available for us to use this is the traditional single glazed unit not very sophisticated this as we can imagine allows a lot of the solar radiation to just come right in it's almost like it's not even present it gets better as in the performance of the building and the ability to inhibit solar radiation is better for these kinds of uh, these kinds of windows double glaze is better than single glaze and third uh, triple glaze is better than even double glaze in terms of reducing the amount of transmitted radiation in addition to the inhibition through reduced transmittance of double and triple glaze units they also as we had encountered already earlier and understood they have air gaps in between them or they have a vacuum those elements also add to the inhibition of heat but there the phenomenon at play is the resistance right so it acts this part in between the two glasses can act as an insulator in addition to the inhibition of transmission by a double surface yes uh, this just uh, elaborates the point further that you can even fill this this cavity with argon or other kinds of inert gases right as you can imagine selecting the right kind of glass is a tricky part of the design because there are competing functions that glass actually performs in a building not only is it a source of solar radiation and solar heat it's also one of the most effective ways to make the place have a, a natural feel have a a joyous feel by allowing natural light to come through this table here provides a good snapshot of the competing factors that have to be looked at when selecting the right kind of glass so let's start with the first one u factor if we remember from our previous discussion about conductance reducing the conductance is very beneficial in keeping the building cool passively cool so of course you want to try and reduce the conduction factor 
or increase the resistance factor. This can be done by the air gap. The second part which is a solar heat gain coefficient. Of course as the name indicates this is our primary enemy and we want to try and limit the influence of, of this guy in the building. So what you would try to do is you try to reduce the solar heat gain. So you want a less SHGC value as is conventionally uh, spoken about. The third one which is the one which has a lot of trade-off with solar heat gain. So if I for example have a dark surface like a tinted glass of course I will reduce the solar heat gain coefficient. However what I will also do is I will reduce the visual light transmit transmittance and the people using the occupied space inside will not have the benefit of natural light. They will feel cool but they will feel that they are in a, in a very enclosed space with a lot of artificial uh, influences around which might not be very beneficial for the occupants. Here are pictorial depictions of the comparative values of SHGC and visual light transmittance. Let's look at a simple single pane glass. You can see 85% of the solar heat that is falling on the outside surface, 85% of it just makes its way through, which is very high. But what that also does is it allows a lot of natural light to come through. So people there would feel comfortable in a relatively cold part of the year. However, in, in the summer, they will complain much more about the heat than the benefits of the visual uh, transmittance of light. Right. This is a table which indicates the VLT values, visual light transmittance values of different kinds of glasses. As you can see, single pane clear glass, great for natural light. However, we will see in subsequent tables that that also means high solar heat gain coefficient. You can immediately reduce the visual light transmittance, say if it's too high, say if it's a window that's facing the south part uh, or, or the facing south and there's a lot of glare coming in. What you would need to do is you would need to cut down this visual transmittance and that can happen by either making it a double pane or double glazing, right, which reduces the solar heat gain as well but also reduces the visual light to some degree. A very dramatic way to reduce the visual light transmittance is something like tinting. Single pane tint extra dark. This for example is used, a lot of people use this in, in vehicles to keep the, the, the vehicle cool and reduce the amount of air conditioning that is being used. So here are a very broad spectrum of strategies that you could employ to cut down on visual light transmittance uh, should you need to. Here is the trade-off part of the design. It indicates simultaneously for different kinds of materials what the U value, solar heat gain and visual light transmittance properties are. As you can see, if you reduce the visual light transmittance, you also get a benefit of reduced solar heat gain. Right? But this comes at the cost of natural light in, in spaces. So let's look at a typical glazing, single, double and double glazing with wood or double glazing with metal. And as you can imagine, if you have wood or plastic, the U factor will be reduced because those materials are insulators in the sense that even the conductive heat transfer is inhibited, right? Whereas if you have the same double glazing with a metal frame, you can imagine if you touch the metal frame on the inside of a window that is facing the sun, you would have a lot of heat that you will sense uh, on your palms uh, if you're touching it. Right? And tinted glass, you can see the moment you go to tint, all the visual light values come down, but also the solar heat gain is benefited. However, the experience of, of the occupants might be something that you, you uh, will need to watch out for because they might not enjoy this amount of darkness throughout the day. Right? These are the the values that are recommended now by the Energy Conservation Building Code for those U and solar heat gain requirements and as you can see they have become quite stringent. These are the U values for different kinds of window assemblies when they say vertical fenestrations, fenestration is, is windows. What are the recommended U values or the maximum U values that are allowed and here are the solar heat gain values for different orientations. So as you can imagine for a orientation that is facing non-north which means south for example or the west or the east you 
are recommended to have very low solar heat gain values because a lot of the heat comes from those directions whereas in north in the tropical regions right you can have slightly higher solar heat gain coefficients because not a lot of the heat is first of all coming from that direction so there you can be a little more liberal with the amount of light and heat that you are bringing in and again it, there also between the north uh, orientations there is a difference between the higher latitudes and the lower latitudes for example in the lower latitudes the sun doesn't uh, spend so much spends a lot of time in the north side actually right for a large part of the day it is in the north side as well which means that you again need to be very careful about the solar heat gain whereas if it's in the higher parts of the tropics right above 15 degrees there the sun is mainly in the south so whenever the sun is in the north it's okay to allow a little bit of the solar heat to come in and light. For engineering students who wish to delve into the thermodynamics of the use of radiation for creating cooling or enhancing sometimes the heat gain as well. The other uh, interesting trade-off is solar heat can also be a boon for generating energy in a renewable way. Right? So let's look at what are the mathematical relationships that we can uh, play around with to maximize solar heat gain. One predictive equation which allows designers to estimate the surface temperature of a, of a wall or a material that is under the influence of solar radiation is what's called the sol air temperature, which is the temperature of a surface under the influence of warm air and solar radiation at the same time. Right? That's this equation which allows you to predict the surface of or the temperature of a surface under the influence of solar radiation by considering the outside air temperature, by considering the radiation intensity, the solar radiation coming in, and also the conductance of the surface outside. If you remember the discussion about conduction, we indicated that the thin static air layer on either side of a wall actually does play a role in inhibiting the amount of solar radiation that is affecting the surface. So this equation here can be used by engineering students or other practitioners who are interested in predicting very accurately what the radiant temperature of a surface will be under the influence of the sun. To look at the radiative heat transfer or the amount of solar radiation actually being absorbed by a wall, the radiative heat gain, this is the equation that can be used by designers. It indicates that the amount of radiation is of course very logically directly proportional to the amount of area that you're exposing to the source of radiation. So for example, you have a building with a very, very elaborate amount of uh, or generous amount of surface area compared to the built up area that is enclosed. If you have a design such as that, it will have a lot of solar exposure, right? And that will lead to a lot of Q or absorptance of solar radiation. What could you do to compensate for that? One thing you could do is reduce the amount of solar heat flow density or the I. How does one do that? If you have a lot of area that is exposed to the sun, can we do something to reduce the I? This is where the role of say, for example, a shading device could be, uh, could be activated, which means that you can have a lot of area exposed, but that area can be shaded using say, for example, horizontal projections that would reduce that. Here is uh, the part that accounts for a transparent surface. So say if you wanted to do this for a, a window, you would have a factor which is a solar heat gain factor of the window, which means that if you reduce the theta, as it's called, you will actually have lesser Q for the same amount of area and for the same amount of solar radiation. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.